earlier, I mentioned the uh, name of uh, Hani Rashid. He's one of two tremendously talented uh, Canadian designer brothers, uh, but Hani's partner in their enormously prolific firm, Asymptote, is Lies Anne Couture. And uh, what I find interesting about this company is that it's uh, one of those design architectural concerns that does it all. They do the building, they do the interior, they do the furniture, they do the surround. Where's Lise Ann? There she is. And she too is a Canadian. Thank you, Moses. Um, I have to uh, weigh in on the side of Danielle about does architecture progress. However, I think perhaps for me it might more accurately um, be a, uh, described as an evolving entity and that progression maybe is something that we have to measure through time. But definitely I believe that architecture does change. The way that we make it, the way that we understand it, and the way that we experience it evolves along with all the other ways that we um, evolve socially and culturally, intellectually. And uh, one of the things about our firm is that, uh, as Moses alluded to, we do a broad range of work. Um, and that comes because we have a broad range of interests, but it also, I think, is something that has come about because of technology in the last uh, 10 years or less even. And uh, for us, I think that we've recognized that if a tool um, is at our disposal that suddenly connects us to a whole wide range of endeavors where you know, there used to be the stock ticker and filmmaking equipment and tools of production and typewriters and other implements for communication and all these things start to come together in this thing we have as the computer. And uh, even more so in design and artistic endeavors where we even share software. And so we've been very interested in the impact of technology on how we make buildings, how we experience buildings, and even how perhaps we define architecture. So I'm going to kind of take you through a, a slice of our practice. It's going to be a kind of visual blitz, You'll probably concentrate more on the screen than on me. And if you could lower the lights, that would help that. And I will just take you on a brief kind of tour um, to kind of illustrate some of the thinking that we've been researching and experimenting with in our office over the course, uh, in this instance, probably the last uh, few years. Um, if some of you were here last year, I apologize if I'm treading over any uh, old ground, but I will just make it quick to just kind of set a foundation. But what I meant about what we rethink, uh, what we consider architecture is um, obviously with technology, we've been able to represent space. And uh, we've also come to essentially inhabit the spaces of our computers. Many workers stare at a computer screen eight hours of the day, and that becomes a kind of spatial entity. And uh, we've been very interested in a lot of the theoretical and experimental work we've been doing in considering that the realm of the architect, um, that it doesn't have to be a two-dimensional page paradigm. It can be a three-dimensional space. It can be experienced. It can be navigated. So what you see here is a, a wireframe of the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, this is a version of um, a three-dimensional virtualization of the stock exchange. We were approached uh, a few years ago to make a three-dimensional model that correlated to the existing floor where they could map all the millions of bits of information that move through that space and would allow them to comprehend, essentially, the flows of data that go through that space. And so uh, this is just a kind of detail. I don't know if you know the history of the stock exchange, but it started under a beech tree in Manhattan. And uh, eventually they moved indoors and they had these posts in a room. And then they began to uh, put seats around the posts so that people were trading in certain places would have a place to rest. And eventually business picked up and they needed tables to do their work. And you know now we finally have these kind of encrusted computer mediated uh, entities that you see if you watch CNN, CNBC is a backdrop all the time. And what you're seeing here are virtual posts. So we've kind of taken it to the next step and uh, every stock in the stock exchange is located somewhere in the same thing in this virtual realm. But 
What does the virtual realm bring to it? Well, we can be in more than one place at one time when we're in the virtual realm. We can look at things from more than one point of view. We can customize, we can tweak, we can uh, animate and show levels of detail simultaneously from close, from far away, from the microscopic to the macroscopic. So what you're seeing here is just kind of looking at different levels of stock activity that are all represented in different ways. Um, but more importantly, I think, you know, st we bring to it also traditional architectural uh, skills. How do you get through a building? How do you navigate virtual space, for instance? So here we invented essentially wave navigation and then we have all of these ways of essentially tattooing and notating the space we board from sailing uh, insignias and so on and so forth. Um, but the stock exchange used to rely on uh, like 40 old CRT monitors and they were constantly correlating between all of these spreadsheets and uh, they couldn't grasp very quickly and intuitively the impact of information that they were getting on a kind of moment to moment basis. So we began as architects uh, to create three dimensional entities that would uh, bring together all of these diverse bits of data. So what we just invented this uh, way of kind of tracking indices. And what was interesting is from an architectural point of view, we just immediately said, well, you know, this doesn't have to be one particular size. We're in the virtual realm. This, this thing could uh, be, you know, representing a year. Or it could represent the last five seconds while, you know, the markets crashed in Hong Kong. So that kind of flexibility was something that was just unattainable to them previously. Um, so I think that as architects we really worked along with our clients to develop a program that wasn't there in the first place. There was no uh, brief for us to do, um, to follow in this. So this was another thing that we came up for them. So wouldn't that be great if you could have a, you know, a box, almost this looks like a piece of Manhattan, where you could just load in all, all stocks that have a common attribute all the stocks that are impacted by a Supreme Court ruling on tobacco, all the stocks that are impacted by a political coup somewhere in Central America, stocks that are impacted by a weather system in the middle of uh, Nebraska. And uh, then you can slice it and dice it the way architects are used to kind of <coughs> examining things and be able to immediately <laughs> identify where unusual activity takes place. And of course the people using this are the supervisors on the floor and they're overseeing activity and they want to see what's unusual and they can quickly begin to identify that. And then this is just another example where we start saying, well, we can also be in more than one place at the same time. We can tattoo real-time data as video onto surfaces and so on and so forth. And so these are just some of the other um, kinds of uh, things that we did for them. And here you sort of see how everything then gets arranged. And now when you go on the stock exchange floor, there's a command center that we also designed for them. And if you ask the supervisors how's activity today, they look at this screen while the real floor is like right behind them <laughs> because they have this kind of like overview that they can zoom in, drill down, pick and choose and quickly be able to um, navigate virtually all of the activity that's taking place in real space in real time around them. And of course when times are slow they go kind of surfing around and they have a good time. Um, and these are just kind of other quick views. After we finished that project, the uh, stock exchange came to us and said, you know, we need a new command center and the uh, brass and brick of uh, existing uh, floor isn't really compatible. We would really like an architecture that somehow would have the feeling of what you were doing in the virtual space. So this command center begins to, in a way, be informed by virtual space, um, you know, embedding information into surfaces, using geometries that and uh, conditions that sort of represent flows. Um, here we did this thing, it's called kind of digital fresco. We took all the logos and kind of disassembled them and reassembled them. And uh, when times are slow, they kind of have a game spot the logo. But um, usually we think about the virtual realm as representing the first reality as we know it. And what we want to challenge is say, why can't we just take advantage of what can take place um, on, on the internet or in virtual reality that we can't build? So another example is the Guggenheim came to us and said, we would like you to build a virtual museum. We have art that's for the internet, it's digital, it's, it's, you know, it doesn't make sense to just put it in a big gallery space on a little monitor. Why can't we make this accessible over the web and have an o its own kind of 
uh, architectural expressions. So what you see here, and, and it was interesting that Danielle talked about the Guggenheim because yes, the Fifth Avenue was this like liberating form from the orthodoxy that existed in the urban landscape. Um, is kind of unraveling. It's still iconic, you know, if you say, what does the Guggenheim look like in Fifth Avenue? Everybody draws a spiral. And Gary's Guggenheim is yet the next unraveling of that. I mean, everybody knows the Guggenheim in Bilbao, but it's very difficult to capture it. So for us, the next generation would be one that is actually continually moving. And what you see here is this kind of navigation bar that is um, moving along uh, a constantly transforming architectural body <laughs> building, however you want to call it, and it's an intersection between a certain spatial configuration and a moment in time that provides access to various entities. So for instance here I can get to special exhibitions and virtual architectural exhibitions and now I can get to the education zone and the media sphere um, and I can click on uh, these to access them and move forward. I can also uh, navigate in other kinds of ways. For instance here I might want to go to the galleries and we also thought, you know, in, in real, uh, in, in first reality, I go to the Metropolitan Museum and I want to enter into the education wing and I have to walk halfway around the building to go in that special door. Well, wouldn't it be great if I was, you know, could just spin the building and it would orient itself to me for a change? <laughs> so that's exactly what we did. And, um, and then our, our aim is not to somehow interfere with uh, the um, artwork that's being displayed, but rather to provide a spatial, experiential, um, a way of getting there, of providing some kind of threshold rather than a kind of tick-tock uh, clock going on. So um, this, this is a way to make a kind of experience on the web, for, again, for all of those people that spent a lot of time on it, but you know, also for kids who are in Nebraska or in you know, northern Saskatchewan who will, may never ever go to the Guggenheim Museum. So with that in, in thought, um, our digital programming kind of expanded and they wanted us to include the whole museum. Um, it hasn't been put online yet, but uh, that was just a way of kind of accessing a Nam June Pike uh, program. And then you can you know, move around uh, freely and go into all sorts of strange conditions. <laughs> this is on a loop. But enough about that. Um, I think what I would like to do now, let me just go back here for a second is just take you to some of our more recent work. Um, and uh, one thing that we do is we also, uh, I'm just, I'm sorry, skipped ahead. We also do um, kind of art-like works and you just saw one of those flash by and what you're seeing here is um, uh, the documenta piece that we did. Uh, it's essentially a very large, uh, percepted, <laughs> perceived as a very large installation when it's really kind of played with mirrors. So there's another idea about virtuality. And it was a commentary on um, how modern architecture just seems to, or contemporary architecture, renders cities all across the globe to be similar. And there was a soundtrack attributed to this that I don't have here um, that really kind of conveyed how it's cultural inflections that now provide a sense of identity um, because architecture has just become in many cases so banal. Um, so when we do these artworks we gain an understanding about how they should be displayed and uh, this is a project for a museum uh, for digital art in, in New York and uh, one of the things that uh, we are interested in was exploring how um, through technology we can begin to model things very differently that we don't have to represent a static condition we can be animating with the computer and it's a new way of of making things so what this represents is how we can begin to look at programs actually being shifting in a museum so what's auditorium today you might come back and part of its exhibition and part of its education and what is a space of display you might turn around and be yet again another program so the tools that we have at hand um, are uh, ways that we can begin to understand program in a new way. And of course, the tools at hand begin to allow us to uh, represent uh, the ideas that we're thinking of formally in new ways. So these were some of the sketches. Um, and then I think uh, for us, our understanding of the influence of technology always makes us think again about how technology affects the programs of our clients. So obviously the technology influence in the first two projects with the Guggenheim and the Stock Exchange are very clear. Here in an art museum, um, you know, it's 
the heritage of digital art is, is you know, cloudy and debated. Uh, did it come from performance art? Did it come from video art? Did it come from photography? And in the end, who cares? Really, what's interesting is that technology has created a blur between all of these. So in understanding that and, and uh, analyzing it, we come up with a new way of thinking about the building where we think about the experience of the museum as being one that's continuous and seamless. So not only are, is there a kind of flux between the kind of distinct programmatic areas um, as well as between disciplines of art, but there's also this kind of seamless movement that takes place. So you hear, you, here you see a sort of continuous visual uh, access to many levels simultaneously and at the same time there's a kind of ground floor that slopes down to the basement simultaneously to the above floor ground level um, in a very fluid way. These are just some of the interior and you can sort of see there's ways of embedding art in, uh, in walls and in the floor and even the freight elevator becomes a digital art display. Um, now for something a little bit different, we were invited to do a competition for BMW, an event and delivery center. I don't know if you know what those are, but you, you, know, you buy a car here from BMW and then you fly over and, and you sort of bond with your car in this kind of birthing <laughs> process. <laughs> you know? um, so they deliver the car and you know, there's in fact a whole set of very complicated diagrams about the car being delivered, about the handing over the car, the receiving of the car, entering the car, driving away from the car. Um, so this is our kind of study and analysis about um, all of that process. And uh, we decided to also look at um, an earlier building, the Fiat building, um, in Turin, I believe, where there's this racetrack on the roof and it's really kind of fantastic and there's a great film that features that called The Italian Job. We decided to update it and again, you know, we use computers because we can manipulate forms in ways that was very difficult with a T-square and a set square a, a while ago and we were able to essentially um, reconfigure uh, the program and the building into the diagram that you, diagrams that you saw previously and then this just sort of gives you an idea of the kinds of spaces that we can create on the interior for this event and delivery center. <laughs> the delivery is kind of a little too... Uh. Um, another uh, way that I think uh, it's interesting to use technology today as an architect is that we can communicate in ways much more seamlessly um, with engineers. And so here is an example of some of the work that we were doing with an engineering firm for a competition now with Mercedes, <laughs> these car programs. Um, this is a museum for Mercedes. They are going to exhibit the history of the automobile. And uh, we were very interested in trying to create an, a landscape for this museum that would uh, highlight the car um, in a, you know, as a kind of, it couldn't be moving, but why can't we have a landscape that is essentially dynamic and that the body moving through the landscape is constantly um, making their relationship to the car and its perspective on the car from different points of view. So this is just quickly taking you through some of the sketches that um, we did showing different iterations of manipulating the floor and then manipulating the skin. And these are a uh, couple of views of the interior. Another example here is a project for the Floriade Pavilion that we did. Um, we won this competition and then we just finished construction. Um, it's a location in this, uh, every 10 years it's a horticultural festival and our pavilion isn't exhibiting horticultural artifacts, but it's there to commemorate the um, municipality or the host city. And this is adjacent to Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. So the, the, the presence of airplanes is very important. And this is a preliminary rendering. Um, it's located partially on a lake, partially on ground. So it has these airplanes flying over, highways nearby, and then it's in this bucolic setting. So this kind of play between the natural and the technological became very interesting to us. Um, and there's a 150 year history to this town where of course they had to pump all the water out to make habitable land, so it's a tribute to that. And what you see in this diagram is the, the, the roof is flooded with water and it flows down and in this crack in between um, are two water walls and that becomes a way that you enter into the building proper. It marks the threshold between land and water. But more interestingly is in the middle diagram, that black line represents the exhibition level in the building. It's a mezzanine. And on the other side, this pocket that's carved out is kind of another where the water collects. And those are both markers for sea level, exactly where the water used to be. 
And then using um, techniques of modeling and so on, we took the wing shape and started to deform it um, through the computer again and looked at structural diagrams. And then here's the kind of end result. And you can see the water walls here in the background. Water also runs down on top of this skylight. And uh, what's beautiful about that is that it kind of puts water against the sky. And conversely, water ends up being reflected on the floor. So this notion of kind of virtuality takes on another kind of connotation. Um, there you see again the kind of effect of the water in the background. Um, we again worked very closely with engineers in attempting to work with this geometry that um, architects have been saddled with fairly uh, orthogonal, <laughs> um, well, fairly orthodox geometries because of production. And um, as much as our tools are changing, so are the tools of production. So we were really working very carefully with um, people to be able to make new kinds of form. Um, there's a kind of funny story about how they made some of these three-dimensional panels. They explode them with TNT. And they were so happy when I was there on a site visit one day about this new experiment they were doing with exploding with TNT. They wanted me to come to the the, the fest, uh, to the, the factory, and uh, luckily I didn't because I got swabbed at the airport for explosives the day I was leaving, and that would have been a big problem. Very quickly, um, another pro project, uh, this is some sketches that we did for Workstation of the Future, which has now just been offered. It's on the market with Noel, and it's looking at a new way of thinking about the cubicle about new materials, about new ideas of, of, uh, of uh, transparency, about privacy, about production. Everything here is injection molded. It's not expensive. It's light. It's easy to ship. It's easy to assemble. Um, and uh, it has a lot more to do with the way that people work now in many new kinds of institutions. This just gives you an idea of all the ways you can kind of tweak it. And we're just interested in providing a new landscape of uh, bringing kind of a breath of fresh air um, into uh, the kind of workplace. Um, and we continue to experiment. Um, and I'm just, I know you're going to kick me off the stage in one second, but I'm going to sneak one more thing in. And just to give you an idea of some of the directions we'd like to proceed in is really working with um, trying to make the body interact even more fluidly with uh, physical architecture. And this is an experiment that we did um, in California when we were visiting artists. And this is a large scale three dimensional object. And uh, sounds done working, but what you can see is there's virtual buttons on this object, and as you touch it, it appears like the object is transforming. And uh, we don't know yet how to achieve that, but we're working on it. Thank you.